Um, how are you? Dinner was fine? Yeah, it was so good. Um, I'm Michaela, and I wanted to talk to you about WebVR. So, did you read the topic or the description of my talk? I think there may, might be someone who might have thought, Web in 3D, isn't that kind of nonsense? And isn't thinking and talking about a virtual reality web nothing more than ridiculous? Or, most of all, should I, as a developer, even care about this web VR stuff? You might have guessed it. Um, I'm here today to tell you that you should care about web VR, even if you are not a gamer, or even if you're just not into this virtual reality stuff, or even if virtual reality makes you feel sick. So why, you ask? Because if this technology is permanent, and at the moment it looks like it is, because VR and web VR will have a great impact on our users. And I think we all agree that we should care about our users, aren't we? Um, this is why I will tell you today the most important facts about VR and web VR, and also two libraries, A-Frame and React VR, um, that you have to know as a developer when you want to create um, responsible virtual reality experience. I will start um, with some brief general information about the concepts of VR, and then we'll have a look into the web VR API and the two libraries I've just talked about. React VR and A-Frame, that will make working with WebVR um, much easier. And afterwards, I'll end with the topic I'm most passionate about, um, a good user experience in WebVR applications. Yeah, before I forget, I will upload the slides after my talk, so um, you can, I will tweet the link then, and you can all download the slides with all the credits and links. Okay, since we only have 30 minutes, I won't talk about what virtual reality in general is. And I also won't talk about why I think it matters. Instead, I want to concentrate on these things we as developers need to know when creating a VR application. So, let's begin with a simple question. When does it make sense to create a VR web application? So, what is VR good at? Virtual reality is good for understanding spatial relationships. And this is because our human brains are designed for understanding space and how objects relate to each other in the 3D space. Which leads to another thing VR is good at. Um, VR is good for multitasking. Um, organizing tasks spatially in a 3D way can lead to a massive productivity gain. And finally, virtual reality and also augmented reality are really good for simulations. A 3D world enables the user to develop a deep connection with what she experienced, and which is why VR is not only good to enhance empathy or can be used in therapy. VR and AR both can be used, for example, to simulate fake limbs or even enhance our senses. There are examples of people adapting really quickly, for example, to a third arm or a 360 degree view. Okay, it all sounds great, doesn't it? But uh, let's be clear, VR and also WebVR um, are of course not the solution for everything. And at the moment, for example, VR should not be used if you have a lot of text to consume that should be legible. And also, since we almost have no tactile feedback, um, this may feel confusing in a 3D space for a user and even bring them out of balance. Ah, it plays, it's good. Yeah. Um, okay, now that we know what an VR enables and what its limits are, we need to talk about the concepts of virtual reality if we do not want to exclude users. So let's talk about some of the most important concepts of VR. First, <coughs> stereoscopic images and tracking. We will begin with stereoscopic images. 
Okay, when we talk about stereoscopic images in the context of WebVR, we are talking about two images next to each other showing the same content, but from a slightly different point of view. The distance on the offset of both images corresponds to the distance between our eyes and is called IPD, which means interpupillary distance. And by showing these images to each eye, we are exactly recreating how we see the world naturally. And our brain combines these images like it always does and gives us the perception of 3D depth. So when we are looking at web VR images, we often see not full screen images like this, but some kind of distorted images like these. And we need this barrel distortion effect to compensate the distortion the thick lenses are making to the images. If we didn't have the distortion, the images would look skewed like this on the right. But if we apply a contrasting distortion to the original image, what we see behind the lenses will be without any distortion again. So, by showing two slightly different images to each eye, we already get the effect of depth. And to make our brain believe we are actually in this virtual space, we need to include tracking. Okay, most VR devices include three degree of freedom tracking sensors for the rotation around the free axis. And more advanced devices like um, the HTC Vive or the Oculus for example, are also tracking the position of the user in a room, which is then called room scale VR. Um, I think you can surely imagine that more, more tracking sensors intensify the feeling of actually being in a virtual space. And this immersive feeling even gets stronger if we include then input controllers with rotation and position tracking sensors in the experience. I don't know whose water it is, but I'm drinking of it. <laughs> okay. How do we create Oopsie. such experiences with JavaScript? Um, let me show you the stack we'll be working with. First of all, there's, of course, the browser. And then with WebGL, we have a JavaScript API for rendering GPU accelerated 3D graphics in the browser and to include access to the head-mounted VR display and its sensors, there's the experimental API WebVR. And on top of this, there may be further JavaScript libraries. One really common library to reduce the effort of writing WebGL is FreeJS. Okay, you might have already guessed it, and you're right, the WebVR API isn't ready today. Um, you can see that only Edge, Firefox, and Chrome for Android, and the Samsung Internet Browser on the right support some kind of WebVR. In Edge, this is only or mostly support for mixed reality for HoloLens, and Firefox supports WebVR by default, but only on Windows machines. Then Chrome on Android supports Google Daydream for daydream-ready devices and cardboards. And there's the Samsung Internet Browser that adds support for the Gear VR on Samsung phones. And finally, you can enable the WebVR API behind the Flex in Chrome and also in Firefox Nightly and Developer Edition. So, and fortunately, as long as the API isn't shipped in all our modern browsers, we can use the WebVR polyfill. One few words about cross-browser support. Um, in a perfect world, our VR web apps work within every browser, but then, of course, with less features in older browsers. So, a non-WebGL browser would get for example, a static image, and a browser capable of WebGL would get a 3D WebGL um, application working with mouse and keyboard. And then, on mobile devices, we can make use of the touch input and, more importantly, um, the gyroscope to create a more engaging application. And, of course, a browser capable of WebVR gets the full experience with all WebVR features. Okay, now let me show you the WebVR API in action with a super simple example. And then afterwards, I'll show you this example created in the two libraries, A-Frame and React VR. 
So here, okay, it's playing. We have a spherical and yeah, obviously distorted video that I recorded with my full sphere camera. And what we want to do is play the spherical video undistorted and in a stereoscopic way. And we also want to use the tracking sensors, more precisely the rotation sensors, to let the user look around while the video is playing. So our setup could look like this. Here we have a three-dimensional coordinate system where the camera is, in fact, the user. And around the user, we will create a large sphere, which will be our video canvas. A simplified version of the code could look like this. Um, if you're familiar with FreeJS or WebGL, you will see nothing new here. First, we create a scene and the camera. And then we create the video sphere with its video texture material. And then we render it all to the canvas within the render loop. So this is only WebGL or, um, in fact, FreeJS. There's no WebVR here at the moment. But how do we render this scene not on our default canvas, but on the canvas of a head-mounted virtual reality display? This is then the time when the WebVR API comes into play. First, we need to get access to the VR device. And therefore, we use the navigator interface extension getVRDisplays. And this method returns a promise that resolves in an array of VR display objects. Here we are just grabbing the first one and saying, OK, we use this. Um, a VR display object represents one VR device and holds information about it. For example, if the device is currently connected or if it is currently presenting. And you can get the eye parameters or request an animation frame. We can then now use the VR display object to render content to the head-mounted display using the request present method. And request present takes an array of VR layer objects as an attribute, which have a property source containing the HTML5 canvas we used to draw on. And the cool thing is, request present handles device-specific rendering issues, like, for example, the barrel distortion I've talked about. So you don't have to implement this manually. And another thing you have to know is that request present for security reasons may only be triggered by user action. You may compare this method with um, the request full screen method. It also requires a user interaction. And request present first requests that the VR device goes full screen. So you would probably write something like this. Okay, request present also returns a promise that is fulfilled when the presentation has begun. And this is the time when we can start the render loop by using the method request animation frame. So we already have a request animation frame method, but we are displays request animation frame is some kind of equivalent, but it has specific features for rendering on a head mounted VR display. It also allows us to draw continuously on the canvas, but it is able to do this in a higher frame rate, not only with 60 frames per second, but depending on the headset with 90 or 120 frames per second. So within the render loop, we are first scheduling our next frame's callback. And then we can update our scene and camera position and rotation depending on the VR display's tracking sensors. And therefore, we have different interfaces. There's the getPose method, which returns a VR pose object with a lots of sensor information at this moment. There's, for example, the user's orientation, um, which returns a quaternion for the rotation, and the user's position, which returns a 3D vector. And as I mentioned before, a VR headset like the Google Cardboard or the Daydream, the position will be none because, uh, null <laughs> because um, the headset does not have any information to check where we are in a room. And to render our scene twice in a stereoscopic way, we can use the get eye parameters method. And it gives us all the information we need if we pass a string for each eye as an argument. There's the offset, which is one half of the interpupillary distance, and there are the render width and render height, which return the recommended width and height for each ice canvas. 
And with this information, we can update our cameras and scene and render it all to the canvas by using the submit frame method, which draws exactly one frame to the canvas. And that's basically all to get the video playing and updating while the user changes her pose. Well, what we saw was a lot of code to create on a very simple WebGL or WebVR scene. And writing the apps with WebGL or even with FreeJS always means you have to write a lot of JavaScript. And this is one reason why there are libraries like um, A-Frame and ReactVR which want to reduce the effort of writing WebGL or FreeJS. So there's A-Frame by Mozilla, and then there's ReactVR by Facebook. And I'll tell you some brief words about both of these libraries now. Mm. We will begin with A-Frame. One second. A-Frame is based on HTML and provides a declarative, extensible, and composable structure to FreeJS. And to get, start with a, to get started with A-Frame, as you can see, it's pretty simple. You just need to include the script and then an A-Scene tag to set up the VR scene. And inside the scene, you'll either work with predefined components in HTML, like we do here, or you can write your own components with JavaScript. And as you can see, creating a video sphere for VR is much, much simpler than in FreeJS. A-Frame has really cool features. There are a lot of components, for example, geometric components like a ring or a torus or a cone, or some geometric components you never even heard of, like the tetrahedron or something. And there are other components to create spatial sounds, um, to include 3D models or a skybox. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have the time to go over them all, but I recommend you, if you're interested in these things, um, take a look at the A-Frame website and check it out for yourself. They have really good docs, they have CodePen and Glitch starter kits, and an awesome visual inspector for debugging or designing your 3D scene. Okay, React VR also tries to reduce the effort of writing WebGL and FreeJS, and like A-Frame, it is built on top of FreeJS and the WebVR polyfill, but it also relies on the concepts of ReactJS and React Native. So instead of writing HTML, you will write JavaScript and JSX. This is the video example in React VR. So like A-Frame, VRECVIA also already includes the video panel component. And this is a source property that we can use to locate the video asset and then display it on our VR scene. And it is nested in a view component, which acts as a container for the VR scene that provides support for touch input and layout features or styling. And similar as A-Frame, React VR also provides predefined components. There are um, not so many like in A-Frame, but they are catching up. Um, for example, there are geometric forms. Oops, sorry. The geometric forms, there are lights, um, a VR button that normalizes click and gaze events for headset that don't support clicks. So React VR also is really cool. Um, maybe if you have to decide, which library to check uh, to, to, to get for your project. Um, you can ask me afterwards or um, yeah, check out both and then decide. Um, speaking of clicking and gazing and input methods, I think we can all imagine that typing into a keyboard or clicking single keys on a digital keyboard is not the best way to make text input. And this is why good v VR applications make use of more APIs than the ones I've just shown you. There's first the Gamepad API, which is already shipped in modern browsers, but it will get more support and extensions to handle virtual reality Gamepad-specific features. For example, um, the Gamepad hand to discover in which hand the Gamepad lies, or the Gamepad pose interface to get um, again, the position and the rotation and also the velocity and acceleration of a gamepad. And we may not forget the web audio API that we can use to apply special sounds to our application. And last but not least, the web speech API, which is uh, way more convenient to make input or text input 
in our VR application. So the problem of input is only one example, but overall I think we should take a closer look at UX design for virtual reality because the way we interact with the digital world changes dramatically in VR. And while libraries like A-Frame and React VR definitely help us coding and with the cross-browser support, they don't actually help us with design problems. So this is why I will talk about um, some UX design points um, for 3D and VR applications. Um, Bo Cronin has created this hierarchy of needs in virtual reality, which I find very compelling and is a good guideline to prioritize our needs in the creation um, of VR apps. The hierarchy shows that the two most important needs in VR are comfort and interpretability, and only afterwards comes usefulness and delightness of an application. So comfort means that a user can use your application without feeling unwell, and interpretability means that the world feels convincing to the user. And only if both needs are satisfied, the user will get this feeling of being present in the virtual world, which is what we want to achieve. While giving these talks and working on prototypes and projects, I added another part to the hierarchy and I added it below comfort, be comfort because I find it even more necessary. And this is safety. And we will talk about this in a few minutes. <coughs> but first, let's focus on comfort and begin with some facts about ergonomics. We are in a kind of similar situation like I think Many of you remember in 2007 or 8 when the iPhone and with it the use of mobile sites appeared. Back then we had to reconsider how we present information on this tiny screen or then on screens with various sizes and ratios. And now we have to think about how we present the content of our, use, uh, of our application when there's no more separation between the user and the application. Our users are finally in our applications. So, therefore, VR applications do not have a limited viewport, but on the contrary, we have an infinite canvas and a user only has a limited field of view. And this field of view, of course, may change because a user can rotate the head and look around. Okay, some smart people found out how big this field of view actually is. Um, if a user is sitting, she can see a 70 degree circle in front of her and with turning the head to each side comfortably around 30 degree or with stretching to max 80 degree, um, the range a user sees increases to 230 degrees. And of course, we could bend and turn around much more, but this means that the main content should be within this range if we want the user to actually engage with it without effort. And another fact we have to remember is that the best depth experience is if the content is not more than 20 meters away and not closer than half a meter, because everything closer than 50 centimeters will make us cross-eyed. And since the devices at the moment have a relatively low amount of pixels per degree, we also have to use large font sizes. At the moment, most devices have around 10 to 30, 14 pixels per degree, and a good resolution to not see any pixels anymore would be 60. So most designers agree that the font should be bigger than 20 pixels. But of course, in a 3D space, 20 pixels isn't a size that doesn't, doesn't say anything about the perceived font size, because the perceived font size depends on where in space the font and the user is. Um, yeah, the further away the text is located, the smaller it will be perceived. I guess you all know this phenomenon. So <laughs> um, a unit like pixels is not the best to describe um, sizes in 3D or VR. And this is why Chris McKenzie, a UX designer from Google, introduced a new size unit at Google I.O. this year, and it's called DMM, which means Distant Independent Millimeters. And it can be used to de describe font sizes independent from the distance they are viewed. Mm. 
I won't go further into calculation and details here, but I put a link first to the YouTube video of Scott McKenzie, and then there's also um, the size calculator tool that you can use to, work, to convert points and millimeters and pixels. And there's also the link below to the tool. So now we know where to put our content to make it comfortably visible for a user. Um, how can we make the world feel convincing to a user? So there are some best practices that you can follow when um, creating a VR application. First, we should use correct scales. Um, if you care about a user's hate and build realistic environments, it feels so much better than feeling way too big or way too small for a world. And then second, we always should provide some kind of feedback. This feedback may be visible or haptic or, yeah, for example, vibrating controllers, or it can be made of spatial sounds, or even use all this stuff combined together. Um, yeah, you should also consider um, the use of a reticle, like here, um, with different conditions for idle, hovering, and active states. And then guide your user's attention with gaze cues. And therefore, you can use spatial sounds, um, lightning, color, or even virtual creatures that catches um, with eyes. This is um, necessary to catch the user's attention. So, last words about a user's safety. We should avoid creating environments that may trigger phobias like um, large empty rooms or small rooms or messy spaces or heights or underwater environments, especially without warning the users beforehand. And we do not want to move things fast towards the camera, especially if when they are pointy or dangerous or gross or something. And also, you should avoid um, attaching things to or directly near the camera. So a head-up display as cool as it may sound, is not the best thing to do in VR. And also, if you want to use a splash screen, don't attach it to the camera. It should be located somewhere in the room. And last but not least, you should respect a person's private space around them. So everyone has this private space, and we all know the situation where someone is standing like near, and we don't want this. So this is also really important in VR. So do not make objects or avatars or even other users' avatars enter this space. And now you may wonder what about the huge elephant in the room when we talk about safety? What about simulation sickness? I guess <laughs> um, making your user feel sick or causing them physical pain or making him or her even throw up is the last thing we want to do as a developer. So how can we avoid motion sickness? Um, so better is simulation sickness. Simulation sickness occurs when our sensory inputs are not consistent. For example, when a simulation tells us we are in a race, accelerating, decelerating, and we are just sitting still, still in a room. And there are some best practices we can regard to avoid causing simulation sickness. Mm. First of all, don't use acceleration. So constant velocity is okay because we cannot feel it, but acceleration and deceleration, so something like this, should be felt, and if there's no feeling, simulation sickness will occur eventually. And do not move the horizon and do not move the camera, which means um, if you have animated scenes, consider putting the camera on a dolly, the camera is a user, allow additional head movement and animate the dolly. And always keep head tracking and a low latency and a high frame rate. Then consider adding a stable focus point, this like this nose thing here. Avoid flicker and blur because they indicate movement and always, always support a short usage by making um, saving states or making your app offline capable. And then consider the use of more abstract and unknown patterns and realistic ones. For example, flying controllers or um, cartoon hands without arms are better than realistic arms and hands. Or another example would be that um, a walking simulation will make more people sick than a flying spaceship simulation. And this is because our brain knows really good how our limbs and walking should feel like, and only slight differences can make it feel confused and, yeah, probably sick. Yeah, if you like it or not, you as a developer or a designer, you're at least partly responsible for the well-being of your users. And with a VR web, 
we as developers may not only be, only be responsible for low battery or high telephony costs anymore. With a VR web, we may cause actual physical and psychological pain. I mean, we talked about throwing up, but a user could also run into walls or fall. And I mean it, I know it looks really funny, but uh, do we really want to be responsible for our users' injuries? I guess not. Even worse, we could trigger phobias or not prevent that abusive or scary material will be placed directly in front of a user's eye. And this is all way more serious in 3D, where we try to make our users think that they are in another world, and then this world hurts them. So, um, yeah. Uh, I guess I have like 30 seconds. No. Um, then <laughs> just... <laughs> <laughs> Just remember, go build cool stuff, but be aware and be responsible by doing this. Yeah. I got some links for you. Um, yeah, and this is all. <laughs>